Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. A new baseball season is coming. When and how many games can be played will be determined once again by COVID-19, which reminds my guest today that in its infancy, in this city, more than 150 years ago, baseball arose out of pestilential dread, a fact that helped foster the creation myth of baseball, a pastoral diversion played on Arcadian fields of green. Major League Baseball's esteemed official historian John Thorne is here to explain why the persistence of that myth is what he calls a necessary illusion. Next. John Thorne, what a delight to see you again. Welcome. Uh, pleasure to be with you, Tony. John, you've written um, more than once, I think, that cholera in, in the New York region, New York City and environs in the 1830s had a huge effect on baseball's evolution and in fact helped shape the creation myth of baseball. Uh, what's that myth and how did this, how did that pestilence contribute? Well, the myth, of course, is Abner Doubleday. That's the dominant myth in Cooperstown, but we can discard that. 90% of sentient beings know that's false. But what has come in in its place is that Alexander Cartwright and the Knickerbockers left Manhattan and went across the river to Hoboken and the Elysian Fields where they invented this game of baseball. In fact, baseball goes back to the 18th century and was well known to all of these uh, participants. The reason that they went across the river was there was a presumption that cholera and yellow fever were both airborne and that if they just got out of sooty lower Manhattan and went across to the green fields of Hoboken, they would, they would expand their lungs, they would breathe fresh air, and while they would not be cured of any pestilence they may have acquired, they would fortify themselves. So the idea that baseball and the physical culture and health movement grew up together is the correct take. And uh, interesting that the place that they chose to escape the pestilence was a place called Elysian Fields. Yeah, paradise, right? Well, baseball is a backward looking game. So we think that no matter how bad we have it today, um, it had to have been better in times past. And uh, baseball is always looking back to an imaginary Eden. You have written that this, this uh, creation myth is a necessary illusion. What do you mean by that? I think the charm of baseball is that boys wish to be men and grow up in baseball while men wish they were boys. And baseball forms the kind of time machine that takes you back not only to a primordial past uh, in the 1820s, but to your own past and perhaps to that of your father and grandfather or mother and grandmother. So baseball is the great connective tissue between generations and the illusion that there was ever a golden age in your own life or in baseballs is an absolutely essential part of the charm of the game. And I guess part of that too, John, is that um, essentially the game looks the same today as it did 150, 160 years ago. I mean, nine men on a field, a, a field of green, a natural field in most cases. Uh, am I, am I, Stretching it too much to say that? Not at all. Not at all. Um, it, it could be said that if you had your great great grandfather time travel from the McKinley era to the present day and you parked him in a seat at the ballpark, he would immediately recognize the game as baseball and vice versa. Even though there are rules changes and distances between the batter and the pitcher and the designated hitter and foul strike rules. And I could go on with rule changes that have occurred nearly every year for baseball's existence. We still persist in characterizing the game as the unchanging game. 
unlike the NBA or the NFL or the NHL, which have changed dramatically in their both their rules and their styles of play, baseball kind of looks and feels the same, which is a camouflage for all the change underneath. It, it's as if mentally we're putting wallpaper over cracked plaster. The plaster continues to crack underneath, but we think we have a smooth surface. How do, how do you think we, we accomplish this uh, act of uh, uh, ignoring the changes that are, as you say, that, that take place every year and continue to believe that this is the, you know, the ever unchanging game? Well, that's a magic act, and it's not to be uh, diminished. Uh, it, it, is, it is not something to rue. The statistics help so that when Cap Anson prepared his monument for his gravestone, he wanted to have cut into it, here lies a 300 hitter. Hmm. Yeah. And a 300 hitter still means something today, even though batting average may be dismissed by the advanced analytics people and wins and losses may not count for much for starting pitchers. Um, the fact that some of the ancient measures from the 1860s and 70s continue to be applied to today's players provide a connective tissue that otherwise might not exist. Statistics help. Yeah. Um, and what about uh, something else of yours that I've read that you talk about we fans uh, observing this game, preferably in person at a, at a ballpark, um, we, we, we become or see ourselves becoming Walter Mitty. Yes, yes, because we all played the game when we were kids and some of us played it reasonably well. So when a fly ball goes out to center or a ground ball is hit to short, it's easy to engage in this kind of emotional transference where we think, we could be doing that, we could be there. And really when you're a fan at the ballpark for three or three and a half hours today, um, we have the illusion that the vigor of our rooting is somehow instrumental in our home team's victory, that we matter. And in, in an increasingly technological and anonymous society, this sport of baseball with its magic act of making us think we matter is valuable. I, I remember a time when I think I felt that way and it was, a, it was the sixth game of the 1986 World Series Mets and Red Sox and I was in Shea Stadium. And that crazy- I was there too. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't see you. Uh, that crazy bottom of the 10th, uh, which we all know ended with, with Mookie Wilson's uh, the ground ball, uh, that went through Buckner's legs. But before that, there was a change of pitchers, and I wish I could remember who came in. And I was at the game with my daughter, 14 years old, and the Mets were in the midst of this rally, a single, a single, a single. Boston changes pitchers. And I said to my 14-year-old, I said, wouldn't it be something if he threw a wild pitch? <laughs> and in fact, he did. How's your memory for that moment? Well, I knew even then that you were responsible for this. <laughs> well, I'm so glad I was. Dick, can you, re can you recall? We I shouldn't have put you on the spot like this, but who was no, that? It was, Bob, it was Bob Stanley who threw the wild pitch, and Rich Gedman was the catcher. And the question is, was it a wild pitch or was it a passed ball? And most people who, are, who would look at the videotape today would say that Gedman is to blame rather than Stanley. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, from where I was sitting, I could, you know, couldn't tell. Uh, but having said that to my daughter and 30 seconds, minute later, he- You look like a genius. <laughs> I did, I caused that win. You're just, I'm responsible. Let's call Steve Cohen and tell him I brought the second championship to New York. Um, well, anyway, it certainly was great that with your 14 year old daughter, you now had a level of credibility that previously you surely did not enjoy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Precisely. Um, I, you know, there's four words we hear an awful lot. 
um, in, in the comments about the game, whether on the air from the announcers or in columns written, observations. And those four words are, the game has changed. But when we hear those four words, they're usually spoken in, with disdain, that something on the field is going on now that just wouldn't have been tolerated 50, 100 years ago, that the game, and, and the implication is the game has changed for the worse. Worst. What do you think? I think change is hard. I think change in any aspect of life is hard to absorb it's hard first to recognize and then to absorb and then to get to the next stage, which is that change is good. And in baseball, as in life, change is indeed good. There are some aspects of the game that you may not like, the, the length of the game, the number of relief pitchers, the way that the game is played differently today because of the threat of the home run and the level of strikeouts. And I've referred to this as the paradox of progress, that we know the game is better on the field. We know the athletes are better. There's no question that the guys who play in the 1950s, most of them could not make a 25-man roster today. And yet it feels worse. Why does it feel worse? It's because we think the game has changed, but you know what else has changed? Us. Essentially, what we have is a game of what's called, I, I hate this phrase, three true outcomes, walk, strikeout, and home run. Yes, and, and it's unsatisfying visually. Um, strikeouts are boring. You know, people understood this in the 1790s when the first printed rules were in German, Das Englische Baseball, where the rule came in that if you took three swings and missed, you didn't go sit down, you ran to first base because you had to have some action in the game. Swinging, missing, and sitting down does not satisfy anyone. So this is the game we have. How is that going to improve? Or, or do you see it improving? Can we get more aesthetic back into the game? I think we can. And I think we have to be prepared to have certain rule changes. The last time the pitching distance was moved back was 1893. The game is very, very different. The athletes are so much more powerful, stronger, taller, heavier. Um, if we move the pitching distance back to the middle of the diamond, to about 63 feet and seven inches, I'm thinking, um, pitchers would labor for a year or two to adjust. Batters would feast for a couple of years, but then we'd find a new balance just as we did in 1893 or the previous time the pitching distance was moved, which was in 1880. The idea that base paths are set by God at 90 feet, nonsense, we're just used to it. We play the game that way. If the base paths were 89 feet, batting averages would go up. Would we like the game with these minor adjustments? Would we? Um, accept them? Perhaps not, because they would be overt, visible. Most of the changes in the game that are brought by owners are invisible to the naked eye. And this contributes to the, the idea that fans have that this is an unchanging game. It's not. What? Give me an example of some of these uh, changes wrought by owners that we don't see. Um, 1969, batting averages had descended to uh, the Yankees as a team batted 214. Bob Gibson had an ERA of 1.12 for the season in 1968. The mound, the pitching mound, which had formerly been 15 inches, was reduced to a maximum height of 10 inches. Not a fan on earth noticed that the level of the mound had changed. But the game changed. Batting averages jumped. Um, Earned run averages started to come back up. The strikeouts and walks both continued their march. Uh, the frightening thing to me in recent years is that strikeouts and walks, which always rose in tandem, are now in inverse proportion. Pitchers are so good 
that the percentage of walks is decreasing while the percentage of strikeouts is increasing. This is in part because the pitchers are great, but in part it's because the batters have pursued launch angle to such an extent that their coaches tell them, don't worry about strikeouts, just try to hit the ball hard and up. Do you sense any groundswell at all for changes such as the two major ones you mentioned, maybe moving the pitching mound back three feet, uh, maybe shortening the base path by a foot. Is there, is there any um, momentum? No, no, absolutely not. Um, fans will continue to complain because that's what they know how to do. Um, those who know the game from the inside out are the Cassandras of baseball. Uh, to propose moving the pitching distance is sacrilege. To shorten the base paths, likewise. So I have no inkling of when a tipping point might come at which there will be a general fervor for change for change's sake. I. It sounds like you think it's not in our lifetime. <laughs> well, I... I my crystal ball is cloudy, except when we're looking in reverse. I can tell you what happened and perhaps why it happened. But as to what may happen next, I'm no better than the next guy. Since we're talking about change so much, of course, we saw a lot of changes necessitated by COVID-19 last season. Uh, how many of those do you think will stick? Well, the idea of placing a man at second base to start extra innings. I was violently opposed to this on aesthetic and traditional grounds. But like the designated hitter, over time, I came to like it. And I understand the reason for it, born of COVID, born of health concerns, that you cannot have 18 inning games in which you wear out a pitching staff and then have to call up uh, people from AAA and even AA to fill out a squad. I understand that the game has changed and because starting pitchers are typically not going even seven innings, let alone nine, you're using more pitchers per game. And the idea of setting a cap at 10, 11, 12 innings by virtue of starting with a man on second makes some sense. You know, there's another idea that was rejected, and that's to allow a tie. After nine innings, if it's a tie, it goes down as a tie. Each team gets a half a win and a half a loss, very similar to the National Hockey League. And that seems to me aesthetically more pleasing, but nobody asked my opinion. <laughs> well, I don't know why not. <laughs> um... Let's jump to something on a, a, a historic, I guess, would be the proper adjective, uh, action that Ma Major League Baseball took back in December, recognizing finally and way too late the Negro Leagues as major leagues. You had comments about that. Why, why did it take so long? I mean, th this is a sport that every April honors Jackie Robinson. And yet at the same time, it took this long, way too long, probably 50 years too long to, to accept or, or, you know, call the Negro Leagues what they should have been called major leagues, or at least the players, major league players. Tony, your point of view is so often expressed that it positively delights me. <laughs> Everyone has said, with a handful of exceptions, this is a wonderful move and it's long overdue. Yet not anyone of the people who make that comment gave a moment's thought prior to the announcement that integrating the records of these leagues was possible and commendable. The idea that the Negro Leagues should be called major leagues and not only the stars with Hall of Fame plaques, the Josh Gibson, the Cool Papa Bell, the Satchel Page, not only the very best of the best should be called major leaguers, but even the guy at the end of the bench, the 3,400 plus Negro leaguers 
who now will be recognized in the player registers. This is what's most pleasing to me, that we have embraced all the players and all the leagues between 1920 and 1948, and not merely given a nod to the stars. You wrote at the time, or you commented at the time, that the, these perceived problems of the Negro Leagues involving this structure and the stats and everything really um, were caused by Major League, or I think your quote was, born of Major League Baseball's exclusionary practices. Without question, without question. Um, those who uh, complain that the Negro Leagues were not playing 154 game seasons as, for example, the Federal League of 1914 and 15 and accepted Major League did, don't recognize that the Negro Leagues, in order to survive, had to schedule barnstorming games and exhibition games, perhaps two games a day, and in some cases three, just to make enough money to pay the players, keep them on payroll, and take them to the next town. The, the idea that the shortened seasons of the Negro Leagues might be considered major league, I think was born of this very, very awful 2020 year. It was born of COVID. It was born of the centennial of the Negro Leagues. It was born of the Negro Leagues Museum having to shut down for months on end because of COVID. It was born of Black Lives Matter. It was born of George Floyd. And it was born, most of all, perhaps, of Major League Baseball having a 60-game season that qualifies as a regular season. If we can count a 60-game season in 2020, then we have to think, did, did MLB ever have a 60-game season previously? Yes, 1877, 1878. Did it ever have a 98 game season or a 72 game season? Sure. So one of the great drawbacks to considering the Negro Leagues as major has been their shortened seasons. I think that evaporated this year. I think Willie Mays is probably the most famous of the Negro League, former Negro League players who's still alive. Uh, from that period, from 1920 to 1948. Yeah, 1920 to 1948. Henry Aaron, Ernie Banks, others played in the 50s. Yeah. Um, it occurs to me to ask you, there may be fans or just re regular folks out there in the audience who, having heard what you said uh, and our discussion about the Negro Leagues and some of these players, um, would like to know more. Where, what should they read? Are there articles, books? What would you recommend to someone who would like to know more about the I Negro think if you, if, if you try to retrace the steps by which the Negro Leagues were discovered by a white audience, you'd have to start with Robert Peterson's book, Only the Ball Was White. And that's 1970 or 71. Then there's Voices from the Great Black Baseball Leagues, which is John Hallway, 1975. There's Jules Tigel's Baseball's Great Experiment, 1983. You could look to my blog, ourgame.mlb.logs.com, and just put in Black Baseball or Negro Leagues or integration in the search box, and you'll see tons of stuff. There's even an integration timeline for baseball and the African-American experience dating from 1820 forward. We mentioned, you mentioned that, of course, what the what Major League Baseball recognized was the period from 1920 to 1948, uh, the, the play in the Negro Leagues. And of course, with that timeline, it leaves out a couple of, you know, interesting uh, uh, accomplishments. Hank Aaron hit a number of home runs for the Indianapolis Clowns in 1952. I read somewhere, and uh, there was uh, there was uh, there were three women who played for the Indianapolis Clowns in the fifties. So let's talk about that just a little bit more. You know, I mean, not that Hank Aaron needs more home runs on his record, but why not? But I guess they had. I guess MLB had to draw the line somewhere, and they drew it at nineteen forty eight. Nineteen forty eight marked the end of the Negro League World Series. And yeah. 
it marked the end of the Negro National League. The two Negro Leagues who were competing with each other at that point were reduced to one. Scholars have identified 1948 as a reasonable endpoint for our evaluation. You know, just as there are interesting heroes of the Negro Leagues of the 1950s, there are great heroes of Negro baseball, Black baseball prior to 1920, who are not getting their due. Oscar Charleston, his records from before 1920 will not count in the MLB database, even though I believe his first recorded statistical, statistical year is 1915. Rube Foster, who founded the Negro National League in 1920 was a great pitcher, but he was finished by 1920. All of his accomplishments date to the period of what, 1900 to 1912-14. So yes, Saul White will be left out, Frank Grant will be left out. Will Major League Baseball, after this exercise of integration of its records, uh, look to include earlier periods or later periods? Possibly, but I think this is a monumental first step. John Thorne, it's always uh, an education and a delight to talk with you. And um, uh, maybe we'll do this again at the end of whatever kind of season we have in 2021. I'd love to. Ditto. Uh, I'd like to, I would like to be vertical at the end of this next season. That would be, that would be a good thing. I, I'll second that. John right. Thorne, it, it's a delight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony.